Welcome to the official Lost Podcast. Today, we sit down with Cynthia Watros, who plays Libby, one of the mysterious tail section survivors. Later, we'll once again check in with executive producers Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse for a few podcast-exclusive clues on the upcoming episodes. Also, be sure to tune in Thursday, November 24th, Thanksgiving, for a special podcast from writers Javier Grigio Markswatch and Leonard Dick. They'll be doing a full episode commentary on Collision. Even though we know what happened to the tail section survivors those first 48 days, many of their backstories still remain a mystery. And even though we can't clear that up now, we can introduce you to the actors behind those dirty faces, or at least one of them. Today, that face is Libby, played by actress Cynthia Watros. I'm Libby. Michael. How many of you? You know, on the other side of the island. When we left, around 40. How many of you survived? 23 of us. Well, it all happened so fast. I, you know, I got the job and I kind of had to leave L.A. and bring my twin daughters to Hawaii in like a matter of a week. Um, so I was trying to figure out where I was going to live. And then, um, I was thrown into the middle of this jungle and I couldn't have been happier because I, I never even visited Hawaii and I just looked around and saw the beauty. And then I got to work with Harold and, um, Daniel and Josh and they couldn't have made me feel more welcome and um, a sense of belonging to their cast. Sorry, Michael. Sorry about what? You know, about throwing you and your friends into the pit. <coughs> friends? What? I just, just never thought about them like that. I mean, I guess one of them's my friend. I'm guessing not the redneck. Yeah, not the redneck. I don't think I've ever seen someone so scared in my life. And I know about scared. That way you threw us in the pit? Because you're scared? And we've got trust issues. Huh. When I introduce to the people on the show, I feel like I'm meeting old friends. And they have no idea who I am. So I'm like, oh, hey, you're, you know. Still, every Wednesday when the show airs, whoever has that flashback will host a, a, a party. Um, and they are very, like, down to earth and in Hawaii you don't really feel the um, huge success of Lost. I mean uh, like if, when you come to New York or LA. So everyone's just um, really uh, wonderful to each other. I can't explain it. It really is. I know it sounds cliche but um, like a family. Of course this family required an audition. I know most families wish they did. And while auditions are a part of every actor's life this one had to be different especially if you're a fan. You know, it was all it all happened so fast. I the guys um were in Hawaii and so I had to be put on tape. And then I thought nothing of it and I kind of went home and said, you know, I auditioned for Lost. It's, it's in Hawaii, but um don't worry, I'm sure I didn't get it. And then I heard that um they wanted to um meet me and blah 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 and I go, "Well, but don't worry about, it. you know, as an actor, you audition for tons of stuff that you don't get." Don't worry, I'm not going to move to Hawaii. Uh, it's fine. And then they test me, and, I, and I've tested for things, and I haven't gotten him. And, and then you test, and then I got it. And, and then I had to leave in seven days. So I think um, that whole process was memorable because it happened so quickly. And it was a show that I loved and respected so much that there was no question that I would go and, and move to Hawaii and bring the girls and totally a, a brute everybody's life. Damn it! <sighs> okay, okay, I'm fine. You wanna let me just take a look at your shoulder? What are you, a doctor? A clinical psychologist. You a shrink. Maybe you ought to talk to my shoulder. <laughs> How'd you get shot anyway? With a gun. The people who, um just tune in, um, call me, and the first thing they say is, are you okay? Because I look so distraught on the show. They want to make sure that I'm all right. But then after that, they're huge fans, and they get a kick out of seeing me on the show. And People always want to know what's happening. But um, I can't tell. 
The secret. Even though Cynthia Watros doesn't know exactly when we'll be learning more about her character, the writers do. And we figured, why not go straight to the source? So once again, we turn it over to executive producers Carlton Cuse and Damon Lindelof as they deliver a few exclusive tidbits for this podcast. Hi, this is Carlton Cuse. And uh, I am Damon Lindelof. So I have to now, I'm trying to talk in a deeper voice purposefully <laughs> because I, I've listened to myself on the podcast and I, I, I sound like a soprano next to you. Well, that's, you know, the contrast is good, and then people know who's talking. Right. I'm the, I'm the girly one, and you're the, <laughs> you're the manly one. So as long as we've got that straight, I guess it's time to talk some more Lost. Well, let's talk some more Lost. So we're going to talk to you guys today a little bit about um, last week's episode, The Other 48 Days, um, which Damon and I wrote, and we wanted to kind of debrief a little bit about that, and then we're going to talk about this week's episode, which is called Collision. Um, so it was, it's a metaphorical collision, though. It's not really a collision yeah, where exactly. things impact each other. There is just no, in case you were hoping for that. Yeah, for the car crash episode, uh, we haven't found any cars on the island yet. Um, okay, so the other forty-eight days, we were actually very gratified to kind of see the response to that episode because it was really a um, an out of the box idea to do an episode which really didn't feature any of our series regulars except for at the very end of the show. And, um, you know, we really have to give a lot of kudos to ABC for and Touchstone, and Touchstone Television for allowing us the opportunity to make that episode and, um, and sort of supporting an idea in which, you know, it's hard in a series to do an episode where you're basically not going to check in with any of your regular stars and... We, yeah, we basically went to them and we said, well, we want to do a clip show for a season of television that was never shot. You know, it'll just be it'll just be moments in the lives of, you know, the tail section folk over the course of their 48 days so we can catch the audience up to where they were at and, and sort of understand emotionally what they've been through a little better. Yeah, and we just thought it would be, you know, when we were first coming up with this idea uh, that there were tail section survivors, one of the things that was really important to us was to make sure that their experience was really vastly different than our fuselage survivors. And so as we started talking about it and working out the backstory, we started figuring, you know, what would fall into the backstory of these characters once we met them. But then the, the idea arose, well, why don't we just do an entire episode where we basically tell their story from when the tail section section crashed and we you know we sort of had this idea that we were going to sort of mimic those corona beer ads where you sort of hold on the beach and you know nothing is happening but then literally into that frame would follow the tail section of the plane and from there we would just sort of race through their experience in these sort of vignettes that would take us all the way from that first touchdown and and that we we also want to have a lot of people and a lot of attrition and um, you know really show um, primarily how they got to be the way w they were in the episodes that had preceded this one. And, you know, and obviously, you know, it, having seen the first season of the show, if you're a loyal fan of the show, there are many moments, you know, that sort of parallel the adventures of our, you know, our fuselage survivors, especially in terms of the fact that, you know, they've been infiltrated by, you know, by these other people. And we sort of try to take the audience's expectation of, of that and turn it on them by having the sort of red herring character be named Nathan, you know, which is similar to Ethan and have him be from Canada. And, you know, we feel right. uh, Josh Randall, who played uh, Nathan, did a really good job. Uh, and it, it feels like a lot of people sort of went for it. Um, and, and Brett Cohen, who played Goodwin, was just fantastic. Awesome. He, he fools me still when I watch the show. So, you know, but, but what's sort of exciting uh, to us about the show is this moment when the, uh, when the tailies finally discover this bunker and, you know, you see Mr. Echo sort of running his fingers over this, you know, this insignia that looks very much like the Dharma insignia um, from oh. the hatch that we've discovered, except it has an arrow in it. In fact, it is the Dharma Initiative. It is, in, uh, it is in fact, the Dharma Initiative insignia. And uh, we will give you guys the exclusive scoop that that, uh, that is another Dharma Initiative um, uh, station called the Arrow, in fact. And but what was done there, we will not tell you. It's, right. It's, it's currently being used for storage, obviously. But but it, it is one of the other um, stations referred to in the uh, in the Dharma Initiative film, and it was one of the research um, locations that was subsequently abandoned by the members of the Dharma Initiative team. So now we have discovered the Swan and the Arrow. That's right. That's two. That's two of the 
of the Dharma Initiative um, project locations. And and obviously, you know, to that end, you know, what they find, you know, in that uh, in that crate there, uh, you know, one of the things they find, and it's and it's not the radio, is ra- is, is 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 very important to you know it the is. sort of unfolding of the of the story to come uh, over the next you know couple of episodes so you won't have to wait too long for that to pay off exactly but but the uh, the items in that trunk uh, were 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 not randomly chosen they weren't except for the blankets the blankets the, the blankets were we are random. not we are not referring to the blankets <laughs> the the blankets could not be they, yes in a future episode echo will be kept warm <laughs> By the blanket and a, and a shocking surprise. That's the end exactly. of episode nine, I believe. The big, exactly. the big cliffhanger is his feet are cold. Right. I, I think he also found those little strings that he tied in his beard in there too. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I believe he did. Uh, uh, all right. So, shall we move? Uh, anything else we want to say about that episode? Um, you know, oh, it I, was pointed out to me by. Uh, by the way, that the episode is called "The Other Forty Eight Days," which we just thought. Oh, it's the other. It's the forty eight days of the. Other people on uh, who who survived the tail section, but it was pointed out to me, it, oh how clever we were by calling it the other forty eight days because their forty eight days were sort of like very other driven. Um, wow! So uh, not non intentional. Non intentional. No, uh, exactly. We are we, not that smart. We get the, we uh, not get, even moderately smart. We get the benefit sometimes of things uh, that get credited to us that we actually don't even really think up. So. Uh, all right, so let's move on and talk a little bit about collision, and I think what's really interesting to um to uh damon and 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 me on this um, these two episodes really i think will completely change the audience's perception of anna lucia i think that you know we've gotten sort of a lot of feedback about her character and i think that you know in, in many ways she's a character that people love to hate but i think in sort of losty in fashion the the what we learn about anna lucia in the other 40 days and in collision should change, I think, a lot of people's perceptions about about this character and their their opinions towards her. I think you know what, what's really interesting is you know the different leadership models that existed in these two different communities and how Jack is, you know, Jack has always been presented as the reluctant leader. You know, his medical experience is sort of what cast him into the role of decision making maker very early on. Anna Lucia sort of assumed the mantle of leader without anybody asking. Uh, her to assume it just by virtue of a the kind of person she is but also what her job was and you know and out of necessity yeah I out mean, of necessity you know the, the the leadership on on that side of the island i mean we we've sort of had laissez-faire leadership among our fuselage survivors because there hasn't really been an imperative to have strong leadership that's fancy talk for you do your thing i'll do mine <laughs> uh for those of you interested in laissez-faire <laughs> economics there's a great book by adam smith uh, that you should check out but uh, uh, that's so anyway, a good title for an episode. Les affaires, affair. yeah. yeah, it is. Or les aff- les affaires. Les, les, les affaires, like the plural yeah. of affairs. Yes, exactly. I would watch that. So casting Michelle Rodriguez was a was something we were asked about, and and we actually were sort of presented with this opportunity um, last spring when her representatives basically said that she was a fan of the show and was was potentially interested in doing television and. Um, we were fans of hers from Girl Fight and SWAT and Blue Crush and, you know, felt that she really had that sort of movie star quality about her and we met with her and, you know, we just were very taken by her presence. Yeah, and and JJ was actually here that day too as a huge, and he's a huge Michelle fan and the three of us just sat in, in Carlton's office here and she came in and, you know, Michelle is one of those you know, kind of rare actors in Hollywood, like uh, many of the actors on our show, who are sort of what you see is what you get. And she's, you know, that part of yeah. the the part of the brain that sort of like goes through the machinations of trying to impress people or pretend. She doesn't have that. She just kind of can hang, and uh, she speaks her mind. And we we had a really really great meeting, and we had had this idea, you know, prior to that meeting that you know. We were going to introduce the members. Uh, this is this is probably we met with her. I guess probably around at the end of February or early March of last year. Right. We were still maybe breaking episode seventeen or eighteen of uh, of season one. Yeah. But we knew that we were going to do this tail section uh, story into season two, and that we wanted to introduce certain characters from the tail section in the in flashbacks in the finale. 
uh, that we were already plotting. So we were out there thinking. And this character, Ana Lucia, was originally going to be a little older, probably like in her late 30s or early right. 40s, as I recall. Right. And uh, and then we met with Michelle and, and you know, again, as in typical Lostian fashion, began to sort of reconstruct. Um, yeah, craft the part really for her, for her age, and for the type of person that she was. And for sort of street smart kind of... Um, you know, very much sort of speaker mind quality, we just sort of became, those, those that got sort of embedded into the character. And I think, you know, a, a lot of what happens, you know, I think on, on this show is, is that the, 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 there is kind of a collision between the actor playing the character and the... I, I, nice how you got that in there. Yeah. Because of the, epi- the episode, it's called Collision. Yeah, that, that was intentional, it was actually. very clever. Yes. And so they... The kind of, and, and certain traits that we pick up in the actors, they merge, and we try to take advantage of that in sort of formulating how the character evolves and how the, what the, you know, who the character is. And so we, we really wrote um, Anna Lucia to fit what we really liked about Michelle as an actress and found that that was, you know, just we, we, it was a good melding between our sort of vision of what this character was going to be. And, and in Collision, you're going to find out sort of who she was in her past and you know for us these are really kind of the most exciting flashback stories because the audience doesn't know anything about who she is they don't know i mean off the island and and there's always that sort of speculation and the mystery about well what was this person's role in the world before they ended up on that plane we can tell them party clown <laughs> Anna Lucia's party clown i mean you heard it here first folks and you're going to be shocked i cannot believe that you would just spoil the episode like i'm just that, saying Damon. balloon animals that's all. We'll just leave it at that. Yeah, Big twist. Watch the balloon animals. Big twist. Was that intentional? It was. Oh, that's good. That's <laughs> and, and, good. Oh, yeah, it was. Big twist <laughs> yeah, and balloon like, animals. You know. It's a correlation. I get it. Exactly. But, you know, I mean, I just want to say to sort of Michelle's credit, you know, one of the things that she said to us in that meeting is I don't want to, I don't want to play a ball buster. I don't want to be, I, I play, I've gotten typecast as the tough chick. And we said to her, we, we have to start you off in that place because that's what the audience expects from you. And then gradually... We'll peel back the layers of the onion and hopefully, you know, the goal of every character story and arc on the show from from Carlton and in my perspective is, you know, explain why people act the way they act. And, you know, for us to, you know, if you just present someone as a ball buster you, without presenting why they're a ball buster, it's, it's, it's pretty easy to hate them. And we've heard sort of, and to Michelle's credit, it's probably very hard for her as an actor. You know, she's probably in the supermarket down in Hawaii and people are just saying, I just hate you. Why did you kick Sawyer in the face? But she's sort of embraced it and ran with it. And, you know, she has to trust us to sort of do our job and sort of round her out. And obviously she just shot Shannon. So she's going to be a persona non grata amongst our society for some time to come. Um, and, and she'll be a laissez-faire persona non grata. Yes, yeah, she will be a laissez-faire persona non grata. That is that is mixing <laughs> French and Latin, something that hasn't happened since wow. the 1200s, and it didn't go well <laughs> then either. But we digress. Um, should we get to some of yes, the some of the big questions this week? Questions. Let me um, let me ask you this question, Damon. I wish you would, Carlton. H Rock eighty writes. It seems as it seems. Is this what is this the voice of H Rock eighty? Okay, I can't even read. Apparently, it seems as if the writers on this show, Damon, are big movie buffs. What are some of the movies that have influenced you and this show? Um, there are so many. Every opportunity we get to rip off something we like, we pretty much jump at. I, yeah. I think you know uh, when when JJ and I first had our first meeting, the uh, ooh, ignore that phone. Ignore the ringing phone. Something important is happening. Uh, we the you know a, a a variety of movie references started flying around and you know the ones you know that uh 50 first dates yeah american 50 first pie. dates american pie pretty much uh lassie lassie the uh the filmed version no mostly sci- you know a lot of science fiction movies came up we talked a lot about um aliens and we talked a lot about uh, you know episodes of the Twilight Zone, which is not a movie but uh, but a TV show. The we, question is about movies. Dan. I know. I'm trying to Sorry. think what other movies sort of influence. We talked a lot about the Crichton world. You know, yeah. one of the things that Michael Crichton does, you know, in movies like Jurassic Park or Westworld or The Andromeda Strain was, is that he takes basically science fiction concepts and brings them into the real world, which was sort of tonally always what we wanted to do on Lost. 
Um, so, so those movies certainly influence the formation of the show. And and and, and but, but truthfully, I think there's a lot of there's, there are there are a lot of television and um, sort of book influences as well. And I think you know both of us have to you know give a big shout out to Stephen King, who, huge, huge, who's you know sort of. So, we ba- we've basically stolen the stand <laughs> and put it on an island if, for anyone who's ever read that book. Yeah, so I mean, thank, with the shout out is for not suing us. Essentially. <laughs> Stephen, thank you <laughs> for not uh, pre- sending a lawsuit our way. We appreciate it. Um, the the um, I mean, Stephen King is so artful at blending um, science fiction concepts or horror concepts with 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 really compelling character stories, and I think that that is so much a model for what we're doing on the show. I mean. Those books of his sustained for eight hundred or a thousand pages, not because of the mythology of the stories, but because the characters are so damn cool. Yeah, you got to make it about the people, and that was sort of always, you know, lesson one. So, right. I guess that answers the question. If I if I can ask you a question, okay. Call, no, by, by proxy, actually, it is Fretzo <laughs> who who asked this question. I think was that was he with the Hobbits? Was he? You know, with sort of Frodo and Merry and Pippin, and it's yeah. Hey, Fretzo, you're you're. I thought that was like an Italian soft drink. You're you're like yeah, it is. It's like a Fanta. <laughs> anyway, sorry, Fretzo, if this is in, in, indeed your real name, but <laughs> and if he's, if you're related to any of the five families in New York, I sincerely apologize for referring to you as an Italian soda. So here it is, Carlton. Fretzo asks, Shannon was the hottest girl on the island, and now she's gone. We need more new hot girls on the island, or this could turn into Oz. I believe that Fretzo is well. A that wasn't a question, really. <laughs> no, and B and B by Oz, I don't think he means with the Munchkins and the <laughs> Scarecrow. I think he's probably referring to the prison drama. Oh, jeez. Uh, well, since it wasn't a question, can I just say thank you for your comment, uh, yeah, Mr. Fretzo? I think you could just leave it at that. But uh, personally, I think Michelle Rodriguez is hot. You know, so she's she's there and. She's the new girl on the show, and um, you know, it kind of it kind of means probably you know maybe we should just put a lot of hot girls on the show and not worry so much about the writing. I just I just think, what do you think that, about that I would say this that if Shannon was the hottest girl on the island, it's time for a pageant, you know, because who's going to assume the the crown? You know exactly. I mean, it's it's th- that would be a very tough call. I mean, it would be. We should we should have a we should have like a lost beauty contest vote in. You guys should should someone should organize that and uh, sort of you know. But what we really know matter matters most, Carlton, is beauty on the inside, as you can tell from looking at our picture on this <laughs> podcast. Uh, no no offense to you, but I but I must say I I am not an attractive uh, man. Offense taken, actually. <laughs> um, uh, and don't say that. It's not true. You are a very, very handsome man. Thank you. Thank you very okay, much. Okay, should kind. we... Uh, Jack and Kate don't, forever? Why are, you, why are you holding my hand right now? Stop That's it. really strange. You're, you know, I'm married. You're holding my hand. Seriously. And I am married to two. Okay. And why are you Just winking at me, Carlton? Stop it. Okay. Stop it. Look, this is radio, but still. I understand. It's not even radio. It's like something else. It's, okay. it's pod. It's podcast. It is. It's cooler <laughs> than radio. Okay. Jack and Kate forever... Damon yes. asks. Okay. No, it doesn't say forever, Damon. Damon, Jack and Kate forever right. asks. All the men's hair on Lost has grown significantly since the first episodes, except for Jack's and Locke, but he doesn't count. Mm-hmm. Is Jack balding or something? He's only 40, I think. Just wondering. Thanks. Uh, Jack is not balding, nor is he 40. Um, and why does Locke get a bot? I mean, like, it's just, I guess he's complete, because we see him shaving his head, so yeah, he is, he's got you know, hair. So he is growing hair. I think, uh, you know, one of the things that has been postulated is that one of the, uh, one of the Dharma stations is actually, is actually hair research a clinic. hair research clinic of some sort that is putting out, that would, you know, microwaves that... In, in fact, the, the, one of the secret mythological tidbits is, is that with this hair research, that's how they were going to raise the money to continue the Dharma initiative. Correct. But a cure for baldness. In the absence of that being successful, the Dharma initiative had to be closed down. Right. And some, for some reason, these, these microwaves affect Jack in a more severe way than um, and any other... Um, Right. Any other person on the island, but it does also affect the underarms of the women on the show and their legs as well. Yes. So. But but look for a new haircut from Sawyer. Yes, Sawyer will be getting a haircut. That's a big twist. Yes, um, coming exactly. Up, so. That's that's a an exclusive tidbit here. We've okay. we, we've gotten right. lots of hair questions over the uh, over the years, and uh, you know we just we are thrilled to answer them. So. Well, please. I think that's uh, that's about it for this one, Damon. I think it is, Carlton. 
well, it's been great hanging with you here. Now just take your hand off again. <laughs> okay, <maybe>. yeah, seriously, <laughs> I will. Seriously. It's fantastic. Okay, well, it's, okay. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. That concludes our third podcast. Don't forget to check out our special podcast this Thursday with Javier Grigio Markswatch and Leonard Dick as they give Damon and Carlton a run for their money on the Funniest Lost podcast. So set your VCRs and watch Collision with their play-by-play analysis and commentary. And yes, they'll even do a halftime show. That's right, 42 minutes of clues, musings, and outright humor that can only come from two men locked in a room with a microphone. Next Monday, we return with our regular podcast as we sit down with yet another mysterious tail section survivor and see what tidbits of knowledge we can get out of executive producers Damon Lindelof and Carlton Cuse. Remember, you can submit your own fan questions for the writers at lost.abc.com. 